I've been blessed to travel many parts of Africa with uh, my passion for fish farming. And in doing so, um, have been lucky to meet up with many, many small-scale farmers. But because of the growing interest in fish farming, I also get to interact with a lot of people. A young entrepreneur came to see me not so long ago, um, and he wanted to build a fish farm in the village where he's from. So I said to him, do you still have family living in the village? And he said, yes. So I said to him, how does your family at home eat? And he looked at me somewhat bewildered and confused. I said to him, how do they get food onto the table? He said, well, they buy it. I took my cell phone out of my pocket and I said, no, they don't. They get it from this. And that leads us to feeding rural communities through technology. What if we could feed the world via a simple message? A simple SMS that would change lives daily. Well, we're already doing that to some extent. And let me explain how. This particular young man, I said to him, so you get a SMS from your mother at home where she's living with still some of your siblings. What does that message say? It's a very simple message. It says, there is no food at home. Now, he's confused by this statement because his family are small-scale farmers. There must be food at home. So he sends a reply to his mother that says, I don't understand this message of yours. There's no food at home. She's thinking, I made many sacrifices. I sent my son to a good school. He's been to university. Why can he not understand my message? But let me translate it for him. So she sends the translation. There's no money at home with a sad face. We live in a community and a society now where sending money around the world is very simple. So he decides, I'm going to send my mother 100 rand. And I'm lucky that I got out of that rural situation, that I live in the city, I live in a nice house, I have a good job, I drive a fast car, and I can afford the 100 rand. Does that 100 rand really buy food? What does it get spent on? Well, the first thing it's going to do is buy transport. Because we need to get from our village to the convenience store where we're going to buy this food. So we now arrive at the convenience store, and at the top of our shopping list, again, it's not an item of food. It's airtime. Because next week, I'm going to have to send another message to some member of my family to say, there's no food at home. We can now get into buying food. And obviously, we need to buy something staple, something that will fill the stomachs. And so we buy super white refined maize meal. Some of our children or, or, or the siblings are still at school, so they need to be healthy. They need to get the right balance of vitamins and minerals. So the next purchase on our list would be vegetables. What vegetables are we buying? We're buying rape and spinach and cabbage, tomatoes and onions. So which of these can we buy this week? This will now leave us with 20 rand to buy protein or meat. With 20 rand, what cuts of meat can we buy? The cheapest. The chicken heads and feet, the tripe, the amakrina, the pig's head, the cheapest, poorest quality processed meats that we can afford is what we're going to be eating this week. And while this situation seems rather tragic, the bigger picture will evolve 10 or 20 years from now. All of this convenient shopping, like I said, even a simple product like maize, we don't have to plow anymore, we don't have to plant anymore, we don't have to water, we don't have to grow, we don't have to harvest, we don't have to uh, pound, we don't have to sift. It comes in a convenient pack from a convenience store. There's no more tilling of the soil, no more herding of animals. We just need to send an SMS, get the money, go to the shop and buy the food. So 10 or 20 years from now, after all this has been happening, what's going to happen when we develop cities like Johannesburg and Pretoria with populations of 50 million people? Who's going to feed those cities? The same rural farmers that have now divorced themselves from farming practices. 
I'd like to leave you with some thoughts around food, food supply, food on the African continent. Currently, Africa is spending $25 billion a year importing food. This is a continent with vast resources, fertile land, rain, farmers, everything we need to grow our own food. A country like Ghana, which has a coastline and has vast freshwater resources, are spending $600 million a year just on the importation of fish. After oil, the next biggest import in America is fish. We have trawlers in our oceans that have nets that could accommodate 13 747s or 500 tons of fish in one haul of one net. There are a billion people in the world who are reliant on fish as their major source of protein. And for centuries now we've been dragging all of this valuable resource out of, out of our oceans, out of our lakes such as Lake Malawi, Lake Tanganyika, Lake Victoria. Africa now is the only continent in the world where the per capita of fish consumption has decreased because we're exporting it all. Tilapia is a fantastic fish. It occurs in 36 species. It's found from Cape Town to Cairo. It is now the fourth most farmed fish in the world. It is accepted at every, every level of our societies. Walmarts, uh, Marks and Spencer, Emirates Airlines, all use tilapia now as a fish on their menus. And yet in Africa, the production and farming of, of tilapia has stagnated, while in the rest of the world there's 85 countries exploiting this resource for their own benefit. The president of Zambia a few weeks ago opened up a new fish farm, and that's only the second farm that I've seen developed in my 30 years in the industry in sub-Saharan Africa. At this particular opening, somebody said to him, Mr. President, do you realize that most of the tilapia that is being consumed in Zambia is being imported from China? And he wanted to know how did we allow such a valuable resource to be taken out of Africa, worked with in terms of genetic improvement, uh, production facilities, farmed overseas, and re-exported back to Africa. We should be exporting this fish to the rest of the world. So we need farmers, both commercial farmers and small-scale farmers, if we are to feed ourselves and if we are to feed the world. Africa is going to be the place to do that. The greatest asset we have in Africa is our farmers. The greatest investments we can make in Africa are in agriculture. And that's at all levels, whether that's training, resources, equipment, technology, marketing, processing, all of those opportunities exist for us. We just have to take them. So the next time you sit down and have a meal, there's a couple of things I'd like you to think about. The first one is, is how easy has it been for you to get that meal on the table through our convenient shopping? What time and energy and money have you saved by being able to do that? I would also like to you to give thanks to the farmers who grow those crops, who tend those um, that livestock. And whilst a forum like this and many, many other forums that we speak at are invited to and we share ideas, the major problem that we have is that whilst we are talking and sharing these ideas, there's a lot of food that's still not being produced and there are still millions of people around the world that will go to bed hungry tonight. <laughs>